we're going to start it out with a bit of a presentation by Marshall, um, and then we'll go into some questions facilitated by Lizzie and Jesse, and then open it up to the group. So just a bit of an introduction. Marshall Gans was, um, sorry, am I, is it too quiet? Okay, I'll talk a little bit louder. Sorry. Hello. Um, so Marshall Gans, uh, as many of you may know, was a, um, a civil rights organizer in the 60s, worked for 16 years at United Farm Workers, and has been a, um, a consultant for many social movements, political campaigns, unions, uh, and other struggles, and has a lot of wisdom and background in the issues and questions that we're dealing with on a daily basis. So this is a great forum for us to raise those questions in a public way. Um, should I open it up to you guys to say something? Yeah? Okay. So. I just wanted to say, am I loud enough? Yeah. I just wanted to say briefly that we have two hours, and so the way this is going to be structured is that Marshall will share a little bit about himself, then there will be an opening question from the facilitators, and then it will be open to everybody, and so if necessary, we'll take stack, but we're hoping it can just be an informal conversation with as much participation as possible. Hello. My name is Farida, and I'm here with a collaborative called Space, and we're doing a project over here called The Public Anonymous. And I just wanted to invite everyone, when you have a minute, to come over. And basically, we're taking your statements, anything you want to have heard or recorded, and it'll be printed out immediately, and then later it'll go in a publication. So it's just a printed document of any opinions or ideas that you want to share. So we're over here right in front of the media tent in the library, and you'll see like the computer and two hot pink printers, and that's us. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. That was not very uh, convincing. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, that's a lot better. Good. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations uh, on being here. Uh, and on doing this. Uh, give yourselves a round of applause for that. I just, uh, not too far from here, they, they uh, started to fight over taxation without representation. And uh, as I understand it, you've been challenging a system uh, that affords uh, representation to those who pay no taxation, uh, and only to those. Uh, and that's part of the problem. Uh, so, I, I just want to say that for some of us, we've been waiting for this for, uh, I don't know, maybe 30 years. Uh, because while we've, while we've taken on challenges of racial and gender uh, inequality, we seem to forget about economic inequality entirely. Uh, and as a result, even those other struggles are compromised because of what we've allowed happen to, to our economic system and what's and the kind of economic injustice that we're living with. So I just, uh, I'll take a few minutes just to give a little bit of my background on this stuff and then hopefully we can have a, a good conversation about this. Um, I grew up in California. My father was a rabbi, my mother was a teacher. I grew up in a town called Bakersfield, which was an oil and agriculture town in southern San Joaquin Valley. And uh, it was made famous by John Steinbeck or infamous as the terminus of the Dust Bowl migration in the 1930s. Uh, when I graduated from high school at Bakersfield, uh, my goal was to get about as far as I could. And I was uh, got a scholarship to come here to Harvard in 1960. Uh, it was kind of an amazing place to come. Hi. It was the year that John Kennedy was elected president, and it sort of infused my generation with a certain expectation of change and of generational change. It was very exhilarating. It was also very challenging. Um, I'd never quite seen elitism or experienced elitism on that scale before. Um, uh, some people are nodding their heads. Uh, you know, they have something at Harvard at graduation called the Geezer Parade. Do you know what that is? The Geezer Parade is a procession of all the graduating classes. And it, like, it starts with a class of 19-aught whatever. And it's like little old white guys, and they're all sort of like this. And then gradually they start, you know, like those human evolution things. <laughs> and then you see the occasional woman. And then there's a few more women. And then there's the occasional spot of color. And it's much better today than it was then. But of course, it has a long way to go. In any event, uh, for me, uh, 
what was happening all around us at the time was civil rights. And that's how I got involved first in organizing and in doing this kind of work. And let me just ask, how many people, is this your first kind of public action that you participated in? Let's see. What, what other kind of history do we have here? Have, what about like youth, organ, people here involved in youth organizing? How about uh, immigration, uh, immigration reform? Uh, how about uh, environmental stuff, green, whatever? Uh, uh, what else? Anti-war. What? Anti-war. Anti-war. Oh, anti-war. All right. Oh, yeah. That's that's well represented. What else? What? Health issues. Yeah. What about health issues? What else? Marriage equality. Marriage equality. Oh yeah. Of course. Transgender rights. All right. Well, we got we got a good sampling. I'm just curious because when when I was getting involved in this stuff, civil rights was the big burning concern all around. And um, the reason I got involved in it was that we had lived in Germany for three years after the Second World War when my father was a chaplain in the American Army and he'd worked with Holocaust survivors and as a child I met people who would endured that horror and who were on their way looking for hope in some place. And my parents interpreted the Holocaust to me not simply as a matter of anti-Semitism but with the simple idea that racism kills. That's it not complicated politics, not a big intellectual problem, very simple, racism kills. And that's what the civil rights movement was challenging. As a rabbi's kid, which I don't know if there's any preacher's kids around here or anybody that comes from that sort of background, you wind up going to all the, the celebrations. Now, while that can be a drag, there are also benefits to it. And the benefit that I really enjoyed was the story of the Exodus, which is celebrated at Passover meal when they point to the children, and you know, it's the story of the Exodus journey from slavery to freedom. They point to the kids and say, you were slaves in Egypt. So excuse me, uh, I've never been a slave, I've never, never been to Egypt, what are you talking about? It took me a while to figure out, the point was that that story is not the story of one people, one place, and one, and one time, but is a story to be retold every generation. And in my generation, it was being retold about civil rights, and quite consciously so. And finally, and this is, I think, very relevant to what's happening, you know, the civil rights movement was a movement of young people. You know, Dr. King, when he led the bus boycott that started the modern civil rights movement, anybody know how old he was? 25. How many folks here? No, I won't ask. <laughs> the people doing the sit-ins, the, the, the freedom rides, all of that, 18, 19, 20 years old. There's a deep connection between youth generational change and social movements and social renewal. And there's a, there's a Protestant theologian, Walter Brueggemann, wrote a book called The Prophetic Imagination, where I think he explains some of this. He says that the inspiration for transformation, for change, comes at the intersection of two things. One is criticality, which is a clear, a clear view of the world's pain, of its limitations, and of its suffering. But, he says, coupled with hope, a sense of the world's possibilities, of its promise, and of its joys. And it's the intersection of the two that inspire change. Young people come of age with a critical eye on the world they find. I think they always have. I hope they continue to. And almost of necessity, hopeful hearts. You sort of think about it, the worst crime a society can commit is to deprive its youth of hope. And so when that spark of hope ignites, ignites a flame of injustice, of pain, and of suffering, then you get something happening. And I think that's what's happening in your movement. And I know that's what happened in my movement. I know it's what drew me to the Civil Rights Movement. So I left Harvard to volunteer for the Mississippi Summer Project, 1964, and that's where I got introduced to organizing. And getting introduced to organizing the civil rights movement in Mississippi, working for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was a great way to get introduced to this work. And it was great for, for three reasons. It's always got to be three, it seems like. I don't know why that is. But anyway, um, the first was that on any scale, blacks were here and whites were here. Housing, health care, education, you name it. In any, any any scale of well-being, but it was also clear 
that bringing some medical supplies or a few books or, or doing a, a tutoring somebody, of nice things, wasn't going to really change anything. Because there was something deeper that was driving all those inequalities. Any idea of what that was? The social structure, but how did that play out? It was driving all these other inequalities. Class, racism. There's a very simple five-letter word that we learned to speak in the civil rights movement that has informed my understanding of politics ever since, and that's the word of P-O-W-E-R, power. That when you find circumstances of such stark inequality, somebody somebody has to want to keep it that way because the people who are suffering from it don't like it and they try to change it I mean, the whole myth that there was no resistance to the whole segregation regime before the 1950s is just that a myth black communities resisted all the time but the problem was as they resisted the white community resisted as well and what did the white community have that the black community did not have well first of all political power they could vote blacks could not vote in the south at that time Economically, there were no unions in Mississippi at that time, and people work dependent on plantation agriculture didn't have a lot of economic resources. And culturally, I'd never had the experience of going up to somebody twice my age who would stand up, offer me his chair, call me Mr., introduce with himself with his first name and not look me in the eye because he was black and I was white, and that went on thousands of times a day between blacks and whites all across the South. You put together the cultural and the economic and the political powerlessness in that, and you get some explanation about why all the other inequalities. Does this ring any bells? So the first lesson that we learned was you have to take power seriously. You have to really try to understand how is it that some people can use their control over resources that the rest of us need to shape and decide what the rest of us can do. And so where that led us to then was the question, well, how do we get some power? Well, some people thought you go to the people that have it. So you go to Washington, you say, Washington, you've got a lot of power. Well, some people thought you go to the people that have it meant going to the white people. Well, that didn't work too well. That didn't do result. Go to Washington, ask for some power. How do you think that went? You're very nice people. Why don't you come and testify at our hearing or do some more research? Or, you know, these things take time. You know, it, you know, it takes a long time it, it, to, to change these things. So what we discovered was that we had to find a way that the people who had an interest in change also could acquire the power to create change. Because without that, it wouldn't happen. It simply wouldn't happen. The best illustration I can give of this is the bus boycott that started the modern civil rights movement that was organized by, well, it was really initiated by a, a union, a member of the Sleeping Car Porters Union. Anybody heard of him? Who have you heard of in connection with the bus boycott? Rosa Parks. Of course, that's the story, right? One day a lady sat down, she was just tired. Yeah, Rosa Parks was secretary of the NAACP. She'd been trained and organized at the Hot Under School. This was all part of a strategy. E.D. Nixon, Sleeping Car Porters Union, was one of the guys who initiated the thing, and they brought on Dr. King to help work with them because he was new in town and didn't have any enemies. Okay? So, I mean, it's worth appreciating kind of how these things happen. And, and what, what those folks... The Supreme Court, the year before, said segregation was unconstitutional. They thought, well, maybe we can apply it to transportation. So why don't we file a suit just like they did, and maybe we'll get the federal government to come in and order the buses to be desegregated, because the way the buses worked at that time in Montgomery was whites in the front, blacks in the back, a no-man's land in the middle, and the bus driver was armed and deputized to enforce the no-man's land. And so if you got on the bus and were a black person, you walked past the bus driver, you walked past all the white people, and then you got to this place you could sit as long as no white person wanted that seat. So on each bus, it was like a microcosm of the whole damn system. Every time you got on the bus. There's a lot of anger about that. Supreme Court decision created a little hope. They thought they'd file a suit. They picked Rosa Parks to be the plaintiff. Rosa Parks got arrested. She went to jail. And then the women's committee led by Joanne Robinson at the State College, decided, you know what, we can't just let Rosa go to jail. We've got to have some solidarity with Rosa. What if we all stay off the buses? 
And so they passed out leaflets. They stayed up all night using the state's mimeograph machine to make these leaflets. And passed out these leaflets. They went to Dr. King and the others and said, we want to do this. And they were smart enough to say, okay, go ahead. They did. And the next morning, no black people on the buses. And so began the boycott. So what was the discovery that came with that? What did that community learn about the kinds of resources from which it could build power? They had economic power. But what was, their, what was the resource they had? So, so, they could withhold their... their, 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 their money. Everybody had feet. Right. <laughs> and if they used those feet, instead of using those feet to climb up the bus and get bus fare, they could use those feet to walk to work, guess what? things begin to shift. And an individual resource that they were just making the bus company richer and richer by giving to them, by using it collectively and withdrawing it, all of a sudden the tables began to turn and they saw how they could turn resources into power. And to me, that's what organizing is all about. How do you turn people's resources into the power that they need to make change? And it's Gandhi's great insight that systems of power are always interdependent that even the, they depend on the cooperation of those whom they're exploiting. Now, it may not be happy cooperation, and it may take a lot of sacrifice to withdraw from the deal, but you can withdraw from the deal. You can withdraw from the deal. And that's what people in Montgomery learned, and they realized then that they had, each person had, if they used those resources together, the power to create change, not only in the world around them, but in themselves and in their community. And when that struggle was over, not only had the bus policy been changed and segregation been challenged, but a whole new way of struggle had been, had been demonstrated that would be taught throughout the civil rights movement and throughout the other social movements that informed the 1960s and the 1970s. So we're going to give a little applause for the Montgomery bus boycotters because they... <laughs> Folks want to come and sit down? Come and sit down. If you'd like? No, it's fine. So that was that was lesson number two was that when you gotta look for the power. Number two, you have to find ways that the people who need change can turn their resources into the power to create change through collective action. The third lesson that I learned from this was it doesn't just happen because of sunspots. It doesn't just happen because of magic. I mean, it's no accident Rosa Parks was trained. She learned her organizing. Dr. King didn't come out of the womb knowing how to organize. He was trained as a Baptist preacher. His father was a Baptist preacher. If you're not a good organizer as a Baptist preacher, you don't have a congregation to preach to. The black church was, was a training ground for leadership that informed that movement, as were the Sleeping Car Partners Union. And so I want to say something about leadership because that was the third thing that I learned. Now, when I talk about leadership, I'm not talking about a position. And I'm not talking about a person. I'm talking about a set of practices that people have to do to be able to coordinate themselves to achieve common purpose. To achieve common purpose. There's the work of motivation. Well, first, there's the work of building relationships. You know, building relationships among people. That's a leadership kind of practice. Somebody's got to take responsibility and sort of start making it happen. And then there's the work of motivation. How do we find the courage, the hope, to take risks, to venture into the uncertainty that always goes with change? That's work of the heart. We learn to do that through storytelling, and it takes skilled storytellers. And then there's, how do we use our resources and turn them into power? That's the work of strategizing. A verb, not a noun. Something that requires ongoing creative work and adaptation. And then, how do we come up with those actions through which people can coordinate their resources to produce power, like the bus boycott, or here in Boston, the tea boycott, or with Gandhi, the salt boycotts that he did in India and others. And finally, how do we organize ourselves to get that done? Now, there's no one way to do that. Sometimes we've been stuck on thinking that there is just one way. You put one person in charge, he tells everybody he, and it's usually a he, tells everybody else what to do. What we're learning is it doesn't work very well doesn't work very well. 
You know, there's an orchestra in New York that organized to have no conductor. It's a great orchestra, Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. Now, they have to do a lot more work. They have to coordinate with each other. They have to have a lot of meetings. They have to figure out how they're going to govern themselves. They have to have their practices, whether it's a people's mic or whether it's sparkling or whatever it might be. But it takes a lot of work, but they figured that they found they could do it. They don't have a conductor. There's no Zubin Mehta. They make great music. The question is not who, but what, and how to organize to do the work. So the lesson that I took away from this was that that kind of work, which is what, for me, is the work of organizing, is really important. And we have to learn how to do it. And we have to teach others how to do it. And as we learn how to do that, then we can figure out how to turn our resources into the power that we need to make the kind of change that we want. Now, I'm going to stop in just a minute, because I've only got you through two years in the South. <laughs> after that. I left the, after two years and went back to California where I'd grown up and Cesar Chavez had just started a grape strike 30 miles from my hometown in Delano and I'd grown up in the farm worker world and I'd never, I had to go to Mississippi and get educated about race, power and politics in America to go back home with what we called Mississippi eyes to be able to see what I hadn't seen growing up in the midst of it. It was also a community of color was also people with no political rights. It was also people with no economic rights. And of course, it turns out California had its own great history of racial segregation going back to the Chinese at the turn of the century. In the 1950s, still desegregating movie theaters in LA that were Mexicans upstairs and whites downstairs. So it turned out Mississippi was not an exception to America, but an example of America. So I began working with the farm workers, did that for the next 16 years up until 1981. Another 10 years of union issue and electoral work after that. And then somehow I got invited to my 25th reunion here at Harvard. I hadn't graduated. I still had a year to go. So that was weird. Then I realized I'd never been to a reunion, never wanted to. What was Harvard doing inviting me? Well, Harvard's kind of smart about a few things. And one of them is that when you're 25 years out, whether you graduated, graduated or not, you're likely to, A, have a kid, and two, have made some money. And so you put those two together, you have an incentive to uh, be interested in Harvard, right? Well, that wasn't true in my case, but in my case, I'd been doing this work for all these years, and I found like so many of us who do this activism, we're doing all the time. And we wake up one morning and we're starved to, to go deeper. Like, what's this all about? What have I really been learning? And in the late 80s, I was pretty starved in the Reagan years to figure out I wanted to go deeper and I wanted to go broader. I wanted to understand what was happening. And this invitation came at that time. I came to the reunion and it was like running into a 20-year-old version of me that was still at Harvard Yard. And we had a conversation. You know how you leave a little part of yourself behind in places where you're involved in things that really matter? We had a little conversation. The 20-year-old me said, how's it going? I said, well, I don't know. You know, it's a lot of problems. Well, maybe it's time for you to think about it a little bit. And so the last day I went to see one of the deans, and if he laughed at me, that would have been the end of it. We talked for three hours. We actually figured out how to deal with the fact that tuition had changed in the, in the intervening 25 years. And so in 1991, I came back, finished my senior year in history and government, wrote a senior thesis in, in uh, declining political participation, and graduated, finally, class of 64-92. Uh, and my 81-year-old mom got to come and see her son finally become a college graduate. Now he was going to make something of himself, <laughs> finally. So I don't know how many folks are taking time off from school, but don't worry about it. You know, you can always go back. Uh, I, got, I got the bug, and then I did a master's at the Kennedy School, and then a PhD in sociology. And while I was working on my PhD, I was asked to design a course on organizing to teach the Kennedy School of all things. Well, it turned out to be a great gift because it was a way for me to integrate my life experience in social science in a conversation with a rising generation. And for me, every time I go to class, it's a chance to have a conversation with the future. Of course, I've been teaching right now on public narrative have 140 students from 31 different countries, only 46 from the U.S. What a hell of a conversation to get to have twice a week. So for me, teaching is all about learning, and I've been doing that there as a member of the faculty since 2000, and then trying to work with organizations, groups, communities uh, that are engaged in trying to accomplish the same kinds of purposes that I was trying to accomplish in my 
time doing this work. Now, I'm just going to stop there, I think, in a moment. But I just want to sum up a little bit. One of the things that I learned from this opportunity to go back to school was that this work I'd been doing for all these years that as an organizer, you know, you sort of thought, well, it's, somebody's got to do this because otherwise nobody's going to deal with these problems. Turns out it's at the heart of what American democracy is all about. You know, our, our system was designed, the, 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 the people who designed the systems, they had no love for majoritarian democracy. They were scared of it. And they tried to design a system that would make change difficult. I mean, they had to accommodate slave states and free states in the same in the same political structure. That meant a lot of decentralization. It meant they put in uh, so-called checks. They're called balances, but to be their checks everywhere, which make it very hard to change things. As a result, change has rarely come from within the electoral system. It's rarely come out of legislatures. It's rarely come from presidents. But the impulse for change has always been there. So in this country, we figured out a way to do it. And the model came less from the political parties than from guess where? Guess where? People. Ever heard of the Great Awakening? Great Awakening was a national religious revival of the 1830s and 40s, created the Methodist and Baptist Church. And it was a movement rooted in moral understanding. We must change ourselves, we must change the world around us. It wasn't about self-interest, it was about transformation, it was about new values. And it was organized. And their organizers were called preachers, or later they were called lecturers, they were called different things. And they pursued an agenda that wasn't just personal, it was also public. And what they found is that to affect the public then, they had to start getting into politics. The temperance movement was one of the first. And, you know, we look at temperance now, we sort of say, well, that was kind of a, you know, who would like that? Alcoholism in the 1830s and 40s was like one of the biggest curses on American working people. I mean, it took people's savings, it destroyed families, it was a huge thing. Then came the abolition movement. Then the women's suffrage movement. Then the first labor movement. And in our time, civil rights movement, environmental movement, the social movement, a movement rooted in moral claims, organized sometimes in a very apparently disorganized way, but with many currents and many threads and many strains, making claims on our parties and making claims on the political system without which it would never change. Now, we accomplished changes like that. The conservative movement accomplished changes like that. And so my hope for this moment is that it sparks a new movement, a movement around economic justice, a movement that's at the core of the whole promise of American democracy, a movement without which all the other aspirations that we have cannot be made good on. And so that's what I hope we have an opportunity to work on together in the future. And the best summary that I know of for this whole, what I've just been sharing, was actually articulated by a first century rabbi in Jerusalem named Hillel. And in it, he, he challenged us to think about three questions whenever we consider what we're going to do. The first one is, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? That's not about selfishness. That's about understanding your own source of values and its significance, your own resources, the role you have to play. But then his second question is, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Not who, but what? Because to be a who is to recognize that we exist in relationship with others and that our well-being is, in, is inextricably racked up with theirs. And the third question he asks, urges us to ask is, if not now, when? And that's what you're doing, recognizing the now. So again, congratulations on this great work you're doing. Good luck, and let's have some discussion. Thanks. <laughs>